And I think it would be hard to argue anything except for the reason that they are is because they, as individuals, and then as the aggregate of those individual decisions as a culture, whatever that is, as a group, a loosely associated group, have chosen to dumb themselves down and chosen to take the easy road of, we want civil liberties, but we want the government to hand them out to us. And we don't care what the ultimate cost is. And we don't care whether, you know, economically or whether socially or whether psychologically. Just give us, you know, it goes to back to that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. This give us what we are owed because we are this disparate group of people who all identify as oppressed victims. And therefore, since we're so victimized, we can't bootstrap ourselves up and we can't work to pull ourselves up out of this. We need somebody to give it to us. And when you're spoon fed, it's a lot easier never to get out of bed. When you're spoon fed all the time, it's a lot easier to not do anything. It's a lot easier to not open a book. It's a lot easier not to work to try and make yourself and those around you better and your community better. And I think, you know, what that article speaks to at least a little bit is how so many people of all stripes, of all backgrounds, hold Martin Luther King in a very high regard for what he was about and what he was trying to do and what he talked about. And yet, they basically are wiping their ass with his legacy in a lot of respects. Hello and welcome to another episode of Make Art Not Friends. They're trying to exterminate and sterilize the human race through pharmaceuticals and transgender movement. But there's a sculpture. <laughs> right. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay, may I read something? Mm-hmm. Um, believe it or not, I found this article pretty easily, so I was shocked that this person's opinion was, I don't know, it seems pretty... See, when was it written? 2019, October 14th, 2019. Oh, wow, right before the fucking world just went to share. Interesting. Um, okay, I guess I should share my screen. Let's see. All righty. Um, the Origins of the Transgender Movement by Madeline Kearns, October 14th, 2019. Um, I've been asked to talk about the origins of transgenderism and how it relates to children and their exploitation. But first I would like to start with a little story. Yesterday I was wandering around inside the Supreme Court chatting with some people who were there to support what's known as the LGBTQ plus community. I spoke with a lovely guy who identified as homosexual and then four teenage girls who identified as lesbian and queer. They asked me what I thought of human rights campaigns. So I told them up front, I think it's a force for tremendous harm in this country. Then I asked, them what they thought of Martin Luther King's idea, the one about not defining people by irrelevant characteristics like their skin color, or in this case, their sexual desires. They said it sounded like a very good idea. Later, two men who were slightly less open-minded wanted to tell me about some horrible feminists called TERFs who are apparently in cahoots with an even more horrible right-wing institution I probably haven't heard of because I'm Scottish. It's called the Heritage Foundation. So if anyone knows anyone from there, just let me know because I want to make sure I don't die by association. The reason I mention this story is of course, is other than the Heritage Foundation being a symbol for all that is evil and far right in American politics, my experience of the LGBTQ plus community was that it wasn't really a community so much as it was a big mishmash of people who feel that they belong to a certain cause for very different reasons. Yet they were all there at the end of the rainbow to claim their pot of gold, which they've been promised by the human rights campaign. That that you could you could take that paragraph right there and I mean, maybe except that Heritage Foundation stuff, but probably be applied. Oh, yeah. But if you change the LGBT community to, to BLM community, that would be equally accurate. Big mm. mishmash of people who feel they belong to a certain cause for very reasons promise, and just want yeah. the pot of gold at the end of the human rights rainbow. Yeah. I've been asked to get the origins of, of this movement. I'm going to try to do just that. Of course, as you know, it's just one stripe of the rainbow, and I couldn't possibly do it justice in 10 minutes, but I'll do my absolute best. There are three things that I think have been changing since the mid-20th century. 
The first is medicine. The second is like what I like to call an ontology of desire. I thought that was a cool phrase that you might appreciate. And the third is what I and others call the politicization of everything. Let's start with medicine. When same-sex surgeries became surgically possible in the post-war period, it was understood to be something of a euphemism. Of course, a person couldn't literally change from one sex to the other. It'd be more accurate to call it genital surgery, but people were trying to be euphemistic. These procedures were highly controversial in part because they weren't always that successful. Um, you might have seen the movie The Danish Girl, and you're familiar with the Heritage Foundation, Ryan Anderson's book, which, in which he talks a lot about Paul McHugh, the psychiatrist who had to put an end to the surgeries in the 1970s at Johns Hopkins University, which he described as, quote, collaborating with madness, end quote. That's how he called it. People who wanted to change their sex back then were called transsexuals. That was a term popularized by endocrinologist Harry Benjamin. Demand was fairly low. It was mostly males wanting to become females. It's complicated, but sexologists realized there were two types of male to female transsexuals. As I always tell my friend Mel, I feel like nobody really cares much about lesbians. Like everyone's really fixated on like what, what men are doing, I feel like in society. Even mm -hmm. in the Bible, actually, there's like stuff that it basically says like, if a man lays with a man, ah, like it's the end of the world. But like they, there's, I, I think it's an extra canonical book, but they essentially are like, but if a woman lays with a woman, I mean, that's, they literally Hurry are on, like, man. <laughs> yeah, they were like, that's fine. They were like, women create life, so like they can do whatever they want. Like that's that's irrelevant and definitely not a problem. It's the the the, the people who were writing that might have been related to the uh, Victorian researcher who was uh, saying, you know, what, just put that put that over there. I'll, I'll look at it later and then destroy it. Don't worry. Maybe. Um, this article came out at six thirty a.m. That's relevant to the next paragraph. There was the homosexual transsexual. That's the person who feels inconspicuously feminine and uncomfortable as a man and is actually a deeply sympathetic figure, I think. Then there's the person with autogynephilia. I don't know if you've heard of this, but this is really fucking important. That's the person who, that's like all, a lot of these like anime and like middle-aged like dudes that, or like the Wachowski brothers who mm -hmm. are now the Wachowski sisters where it's like, dude, you're a 60 year old man with a wig on with a very deep voice. Like, what are you doing? Right. Um, that's the person who finds the thought of themselves as a woman to be sexually exciting. Studies of interviews with such individuals conducted by sexologists like Ray Blanchard or Ann Lawrence suggest that it's anything ranging from a man who's turned on from the Czech assistant calling him ma'am to somebody who likes to urinate on sanitary pads and to pretend they're menstruating and many other things that I think many of us would find too unpleasant to dwell on so early in the morning. <laughs> In my friend Douglas Murray's new book, The Madness of Crowds, he explains that the struggle for defining things has turned into this hardware versus software issue. So intersex, for instance, is very much a hardware issue. You can't exactly get concerned about somebody who has a hardware issue because that's not their fault. Like somebody who's born, you know. Of course, the reality with homosexuality is that it's most likely some combination of the two. People may be predisposed to certain proclivities, then there's environment and so forth. But in any case, like Martin Luther point, King's point, don't define people by that. This brings me to my second point, which, is what, which was what I'm calling the ontology of desire. That's basically when in the 1900s, the definition of trans began to change. Transsexualism, specifically as a sexual fetish, as autogynephilia, had been known as a perversion. This was politically incorrect, so they changed it to paraphilia, which became politically incorrect and is now known as an identity. The broader term, quote, gender dysphoria, end quote, former gender identity disorder, is actually still listed in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So it's still a disorder in the DSM, but that'll likely change. I think that has changed already. I don't know so when they removed it in 2019. Anyway. Um, transgenderism was wide and adopted and celebrated in the academy in large part thanks to people like Judith Butler who thought that gender was a performance. This is where it gets really interesting in the contradictions. On the one hand, this is Murray's point, transgenderism is a hardware issue for trans people, but for everyone, this part I don't really understand, but for everyone else, gender is a software issue. So if you think about it, the only people who are born women are trans women, which is rather an astonishing claim. This is where the quote, boy's brain in a girl's body quote, 
stuff comes in, which turns out to be more of a metaphor. A more accurate metaphor might be that of a soul. So now we're getting to what I, my, my ultimate point that I want to make about the anima and the animus, which connects to what you were saying about all of the alchemical and, and the cult stuff. Um, Okay, a more accurate metaphor might be that of a soul, a gendered soul, the fundamental essence of a person. It goes back a very long way to the Gnostic heresies in ancient times. The idea is that matter is less important and that it's all about your spirit or your essence. The exploitation of language evolved so quickly that basically everybody calling a trans woman she, initially that was meant to be a courtesy to accommodate people, not to make somebody who's had a hard life have a harder life is now meant to signal our absolute uncontested belief in their femaleness because it doesn't, which it doesn't because trans women are men. Not that there's anything wrong with being a man, even if some people are uncomfortable being men. And fair enough. The third point is the massive cultural and political tidal wave. The thing is, in the 1900s, people might have been forgiven for thinking, this will never catch on. This is so outrageous. This is absurd. They would obviously be right. But the thing was, the internet and all these other things came into play, which is, I could not agree more. Society had just gotten used to defining whole sections of the population by their desires with regards to homosexuality, which was trying to correct genuine injustices that gay people faced in this country and still face across the world. They overcorrected and they became obsessed with identity. That's why I chose to read this article because she calls that out. We moved further and further away from the sort of vision that Martin Luther King set out. We started to lose sight of all these different intricacies with regard to sexuality. Then, Trans piggybacked onto gay rights, which had piggybacked onto civil rights. Blah, 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 blah. I don't know if I want to read. And oh, okay, well, this is, this is, um, this is important. Which brings me on to the final point. What has any of this got to do with sexualizing children? I want to suggest two things. The first is that it's created a massive cultural blind spot. Psychologists have always understood transsexualism to relate to or potentially relate to adult sexuality. We could have a debate about whether we think urinating on sanitary pads is normal behavior or not. We can have that debate, but it is about sexuality. It's been masked by an ideology, and because of the politics of it all, there's a great fear for many people. It's legitimate fear because they might get fired or worse for signaling some terrible phobia. This becomes very obvious on the subject of drag. Drag, which means dressed as girl, oh, I didn't know that, comes from the Elizabethan period where women were forbidden from performing publicly. So men assumed the role of women. For some drag queens, I was speaking to one yesterday, James Davis, whose stage name is Elaine Lancaster. Wow, Lancaster is not far from me. It really is about performance. I come from the UK where we have this genre of theater called pantomime, and it's funny. It's just men dressed up as women called dames, but these things are very context dependent. Davis yesterday was agreeing with me. While he was saying that for him it's about performance, he recognizes that when he's in bars and other public places, people come up to him at the end and it's all about sex for them. As an adult, who knows, as an adult who knows that and understands that, he can deal with it. He can say whether he wants to get involved or not. After all, it's a free country. But why would we put children in that situation? Why would we invite salacious interest in children by dressing them up in drag? We shouldn't do that. And I'm referring here to a whole new phenomenon called drag kids. Wow, I didn't know she was going to go here, but I'm glad she did. The argument we're supposed to accept rather unthinkingly that is that, oh, you're just being bigoted and you're just preju prejudiced because this is about self-expression. And I'm thinking, well, no, because yes, children dress up, but again, it's context dependent. The analogy I would invite you to is that imagine there's a little girl in a bikini. She's 13 years old in her parents' private pool. Is it a problem that she's wearing a bikini? No, it's not a big problem. She's in her parents' private pool. But if the same girl in the same bikini, still 13 years old, is walking down a catwalk in a room full of adults, would we all feel uncomfortable? Yes, we all would feel uncomfortable. It's a completely different thing. And it's the same when it comes to drag. This is not hypothetical. I invite you to look up the case of Desmond is Amazing, who should really be called Desmond Needs <laughs> Saving, because this poor little boy is dressed up in drag, gyrating in gay clubs in Brooklyn, and few have said anything because to do so would be homophobic. Well, no, sorry. Because this drag queen and other gay people would say the same thing on this, it's just not is it's just not on that must be some kind of british phrase that i'm not familiar it's just with. not accurate or on point it is not and never should be acceptable to sexualize children our friends at the human rights campaign would prefer that none of us knew these intricacies that people like me didn't exist to remind you of them that people like james davis the drag queen didn't exist or those open-minded people at the rally who thought that martin luther king had a point didn't exist 
They would prefer that the only people who opposed the sexualization of children were the horrible, frightening right men, right wing boogeyman, the Heritage Foundation. Everyone who's too scared to talk about this will just have to get over that because there's too much at stake, I'm sorry to say. And to be honest, the worst thing they can do is say that you're the boogeyman and you'd say boo, and that's it. You're done. Um, so pretty all good in article, all, considering. pretty good article. And, and all I typed in was, um, I think I typed in conservatives funding the trans movement. Because there was this thing that I saw on Telegram, and I'm sure you would know who they were. Oh, I really... Well, while you look that up, I've I've got if you can take a question, oh, yeah, go, a, a side question at the same time, which is kind of unrelated to this, but you know, fairly unrelated. But I don't know if you ever saw the Adult Swim cartoon Boondocks, which was based on the comic yep. strip by the same name. Yep. Did you see that episode where Martin Luther King, it turns out, had been in a coma, and he gets he he wakes up it's like it's in the first season it's the first handful of episodes anyway martin luther king comes out of his coma in the year 2005 or whenever the show was supposed to have taken place and gets invited to basically speak in front of what would have been the modern equivalent of getting people who would be interested in listening to martin luther king together in one place uh and it's basically like this club i mean it's basically like a club in the way that you or i would think of you know clubbing going to the club that's where they can get all these people from this culture together so that's where they have mlk come back to to give his first speech now that he's woken up from his coma that speech from that show i'll find a clip of it if i can and 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 attach it down in the show notes because it's definitely worth watching that speech that magruder and his writers whomever put in the, the you know their MLK character was not only by my estimation pretty accurate to what what the, uh, Dr. King would have said had he come back in the early 2000s or especially today but it's a pretty should be pretty sobering lesson about and I think the whole episode is intended to be a pretty sobering lesson about how Martin Luther King was supposed to be this great man. We've named streets after him. He's got his own holiday. And it's what, 50 years later? 50 years. I think he died in 65, memory serves. 50 years, some years later. And the main people that he is said to have been active on behalf of are probably more compromised and ignorant than they were at the time and i think it would be hard to argue anything except for the reason that they are is because they as individuals and then as the aggregate of those individual decisions as a culture whatever that is as a group a loosely associated group have chosen to dumb themselves down Excuse me, brothers and sisters, please. If someone could just turn off. King looked out on his people and saw they were in great need. So he did what all great leaders do. He told them the truth. Will you ignorant niggas please shut the hell up? He just said what I think he said. Is this it? This is what I got all those ass whoopings for? I had a dream once. It was a dream that little black boys and little black girls would drink from the river of prosperity, freed from the thirst of oppression. But lo and behold, some four decades later, what have I found but a bunch of trifling, shiftless, Good for nothing, niggas. And I know some of you don't want to hear me say that word. It's the ugliest word in the English language. But that's what I see now, niggas. And you don't want to be a nigger. Cause niggas are living contradictions. Niggas are full of unfulfilled ambitions. 
Niggas wax and wane. Niggas love to complain. Niggas love to hear themselves talk but hate to explain. Niggas love being another man's judge and jury. Niggas procrastinate until it's time to worry. Niggas love to be late. Niggas hate to hurry. Black entertainment television is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. Usher, Michael Jackson is not a genre of music. And now I'd like to talk about Soul Plane. I've seen what's around the corner. I've seen what's over the horizon. And I promise you, you niggas have nothing to celebrate. And no, I won't get there with you. I'm going to Canada. And chosen to take the easy road of we want civil liberties, but we want the government to hand them out to us. And we don't care what the ultimate cost is. And we don't care whether, you know, economically or whether socially or whether psychologically. Just give us, you know, it goes to back to that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. This give us what we are owed because we are this disparate group of people who all identify as oppressed victims. And therefore, since we're so victimized, we can't bootstrap ourselves up and we can't work to pull ourselves up out of this. We need somebody to give it to us. And when you're spoon fed, it's a lot easier never to get out of bed. When you're spoon fed all the time, it's a lot easier to not do anything. It's a lot easier to not open a book. It's a lot easier not to work to try and make yourself and those around you better and your community better. And I think, you know, what that article speaks to at least a little bit is how so many people of all stripes, of all backgrounds, hold Martin Luther King in a very high regard for what he was about and what he was trying to do and what he talked about. And yet they basically are wiping their ass with his legacy in a lot of respects. Yeah. I mean, I don't even know what to say. (laughs) And this is just the the newest iteration of that. I mean, that was so spot on. I'm really surprised that the national review would have such a, I'm telling you, I was like, article, you know, get on like whatever on page writer. one of, of Google. And I was like, what? Yeah. what? But yeah, I mean, it brings up a lot of, you know, interesting things to think about, which is, you know, I think one of the uh, problems with socially conscious journalism is it tends to be like, here's what you should think about this or that. And that article, I think, did a good job of kind of presenting hey, here's some ideas to keep in mind as you go forward with and, and interact with these concepts that might be new to some people. But um, yeah, so whoever wrote that, I guess I'm you know, good on you. And I think that uh, gender dysphoria is still in the DSM. I can't tell for sure, but although it might have changed from gender identity disorder to gender just for anyway i can't quite tell but it's certainly this this article from psychiatry.org definitely spends like one little couple of bullet points talking about adult dysphoria and adolescence and adults or gender dysphoria and adolescence and adults and then really kind of dives into like oh but here's why you know really we need to concentrate on more on the adolescence than the adults which kind of goes back to that article a little bit but yeah the MLK thing and the identity thing speak to your point, reinforces your point, and I think it's pretty spot on. So good article, surprisingly. Yeah. Um, oh, here we go. Arcus Foundation. I found it. Oh, good. Then I vamped long enough for... Yes, I'm. It's crazy. It's it's all out there. Like literally, you can find shit on page one of Google if you just know what to type in. It's just crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, We're still smarter than the damn algorithm. Yeah. If we can learn how to manipulate the algorithm to our advantage, then we're still better than it. We're smarter. Shouldn't be surprised because 
It's a fucking algorithm. <laughs> so um, yeah, so fun fact: the 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 um, I guess I might as well. Let's see. So this is what I was looking for. Is um, I couldn't find it on Telegram. Can I move this? Okay, good. Um, so yeah, there was. I was looking for this stuff, and I found this article on the Standard. Mm -hmm. August 2019. Um, August 2019. So a lot of this stuff was coming. Like people were waking up to a lot of this stuff, and I feel like they were like, "Release the gas." You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> the goyim know too much, or whatever. You know, it's that, that's a joke. That's a joke. <laughs> joke. Oh god. They're um, Zionists. I knew it. What? So it says billionaires funding transgender movement for profit. Who are these wealthy men institutionalizing gen transgender ideology? These are men and women who invest in a biomedical in biomedical companies and are funding myriad mm. transgender organizations whose agenda will make them gobs of money. Uh, as an environmental activist who was deplatformed from a speaking venue by trans activists in 2013, I developed curiosity about the power of this group to force this development. A year later, when Time Magazine announced the transgender tipping point on its cover, I had already begun to examine the money behind the transgender project. I have watched as all women's safe spaces, universities, and sports open their doors to any man who chose to identify as a woman, whereas men who identify as trans women are at the forefront of this project, women who identify as trans men seem silent and invisible. I was astonished that such a huge cultural change of the opening of sex-protected spaces was happening at such a meteoric pace and without consideration for women and girls, safety, deliberation, or public debate. Concurrent with these rapid changes, I witnessed an overhaul in the English language with new pronouns and a near tyrannical assault on those who did not use them. Laws mandating new speech were passed. Hey, Laws new speech, new speech. Where have I heard that before? Yeah. George Orwell? No. Laws overriding biological sex with the amorphous concept of gender identity are being instituted now. People who speak openly about these changes can find themselves, their families, and their livelihoods threatened. These elements, along with media saturation, the issue had me wondering, is this really a civil rights issue for a tiny part of the population with body dysphoria, or is there a bigger agenda with moneyed interests that we are not seeing? This article can only begin to graze the surface of this question, but considering transgenderism has basically exploded in the middle of capitalism, which is notorious for subsuming social justice movements, there's value in beginning this examination. With that said, who is funding the transgender movement? I found exceedingly rich white men with enormous cultural influence are funding the transgender lobby and various transgender organizations. The, uh, you know Alison McDowell, right? She talks Name about sounds this. familiar. She talks about some of this stuff in her research. She's a really okay. good researcher. Okay, yeah. These include, but are not limited to, Jennifer Pritzker, a male who identifies as transgender of the that's, Pritzker Foundation. That's 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 job of the hut there, right? Yes. That's, okay. That's there's sorry, a, that's mean, but I don't care. George Soros. We've already jumped off the diving board. George Soros, Martine Rothblatt, a man who identifies as transgender and transhumanist. Wow, trans everything. There's there's. That I identify as again. a non-gendered machine. Good for you, Martine Rothblatt. Tim Gill, a gay man, Drummond Pike, Warren and Peter Buffett, John Stryker, a gay man, Mark Bonham, a gay man, and Rick Wyland, a deceased gay man whose philanthropy is still LGBT oriented. Most of these billionaires fund the transgender lobby and organizations through their own organizations, including corporations. Separating transgender issues from LGBT infrastructure is not an easy task. All the wealthiest donors have been funding LGB institutions before they became LGBT oriented. The T just jumped right on there. Mm. Uh, and only in some instances are monies earmarked specifically for transgender issues. Some of these billionaires fund the LGBT through their myriad companies, multiplying their contributions many times over in ways that are difficult to track. Hmm, sound familiar? It sounds almost like Bill Gates is investing slash philanthropy strategy. Um, well, you know, if you believe some of the rumors about his, her wife. Right. Oh, I, yeah, I don't. I, right. Um, he is. All right, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. These funders often go through Foundation. anonymous funding organizations such as Tides Foundation, founded and operated by Pike. Large corporations, philanthropists, and organizations can send enormous sums of money to the Tides Foundation. Specifically, sorry, specify the direction these funds are to go and have the funds get to their destination anonymously. 
Tides Foundation creates a legal firewall and tax shelter for foundations and funds political campaigns, often using legally dubious tactics. Yeah, the, I know well, the Tides Foundation. really fund- familiar. I know the Tides Foundation and, and the political. I didn't know it was involved in LGBT whatever funding. Well, of course, the octopus has its, its tentacles. Right, right, right. These men and others, including pharmaceutical companies and the U.S. government, are sending millions of dollars to LGBT causes. Overall reported global spending on LGBT is now estimated at $424 million. From 2003 to 2013, reported funding for transgender issues increased more than eightfold, growing at threefold the increase of LGBTQ funding overall, which quadrupled from 2003 to 2012. This huge spike in funding happened at the same time transgenderism began gaining traction in American culture. $424 million is a lot of money. Is it enough to change laws, uproot language, and force new speech on the public to censor, to create an atmosphere of threat for those who do not comply with gender identity ideology? It seems obvious now to look at the money behind transgenderism. Many new markets have opened because of it. The first gender clinic for children opened in Boston in 2007. Of in course past, it was Boston. Of course it was Boston. In the past, that's where my friend went to school, the one that works for Big Pharma. Well, and that's, you know, talk about the civil rights movement totally destroying a state through how it was. The Massachusetts... I don't remember statistically. I'd have to kind of refresh my memory, but... Massachusetts was like a fairly decent state in the 50s and 60s as far as income, equality, et cetera, et cetera. And then it was like became after the civil rights movement, the most civil rightsy of all the states and entitlement related and government pension yeah, dole Ma- kind of thing. And now it's it's one of the in- poorest, most disparate, uh, the biggest dis- uh, disparity, disparity in income. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. And, but yeah, Massachusetts is definitely like. I would say Massachusetts and Connecticut are more than anything else, at least in New England, are like a serious microcosm slash like specter of America's future because, Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, you just have like these like quadrillionaire hospitals and pharmaceutical companies and insurance companies like essentially across the street from like red hot ghetto crack houses like trailer parks like you know boston um yeah and massachusetts in particular it's really interesting because you have all of this like talk of like you know inner city um you know like 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 whatever like like uh black people of color and and, you know like basically non-white um people that are very poor and are in these like this sort of forlorn environment, but Massachusetts has an enormous number of like extremely poor white people, like Irish and white people Mm -hmm. that are living in some of the most horrible squalid conditions ever. And yeah, and it's, it's uh, and right. And, and the, the, the main issues that they are, you know, grappling with is like this invented trans stuff. And I think in general, that's a a good thing to remember is that, you know, we have like such serious issues right now in society. Like we have a food issue, we have a medical tyranny issue, we have a government overreach issue, we have so many things. And yet we are literally arguing over bathroom access. Like, on a on a world or at least national scale like so that when i say this is all very kindergarten it really it really is yeah anything to keep people distracted from the real issues right right all right sorry first gender clinic in boston 2007 that's where i cut so, you yeah off. um in the past 10 years more than 30 clinics for children with purported gender dysphoria have arisen in the united states alone the largest serving 725 patients Over the past decade, there's been an explosion in transgender medical infrastructure across the United States and the world to, quote unquote, treat transgender people. In addition to gender clinics proliferating across the United States, hospital wings are being built for specialized surgeries and many medical institutions are clamoring to get on board with the new developments. Forget all the people that can't get, you know, cancer treatment or heart surgery or transplants because of COVID. Let's let's build more. And you know what this reminds me of a little bit? I don't know if you're familiar with the history of um, uh, lobotomy. But in the the lobotomy was such a huge, huge thing and the medical community, just embraced it. And everybody was clamoring to get on board with the new developments. 
And then the guy that invented it, the Spanish doctor, whose name I can't remember, won the Nobel Prize for medicine for creating the lobotomy. And now it's considered one of the biggest dark, you know, spots, uh, the, the, the biggest dark moments, the low points, and 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 not only medical, uh, the medical uh, uh, the institutions and medical academia, but in the history of the Nobel Prize. <laughs> But that it reminds me of this a little bit. Like in 30 years, if you know we're still able to, to ask these kind of questions, are we gonna have people going, Wow, why the hell did we do that? <laughs> why did everybody think that was good to start opening these clinics? And uh, who knows? Yeah, no, yeah, that's um Sorry, I'm just reading the rest of this article and it's really fucking disturbing. Um, doctors are being trained in cadaver symposiums across the world in all manner of surgeries related to transgender individuals, including phalloplasty, vaginoplasty, facial feminization surgery, urethral procedures, and more. More and more American corporations are covering transgender surgeries, drugs, and other expenses. Endocrinologists seeking the fountain of youth and hormones for more than a generation and the subsequent earnings for marketing these hormones are still on a quest for gold. Puberty blockers are another growing mar market. The plastic surgery arm of medicine is staged for an infusion of cash as well as organ transplants, especially womb transplants for men identifying as women who may want future pregnancies. These surgeries are already being practiced on animals and the first successful womb implant from a deceased female donor to another female has already been a success. What? Biogenetics is supposed to be the investment of the future, says Rothblatt, who has headed a massive pharmaceutical corporation and is now heavily invested in biogenetics and transplants. Transgenderism has certainly made its way into the American marketplace, so it seems important to consider the implications of this as we pass laws regarding transgender individuals and our civil liberties. Transgenderism sits square in the middle of the medical industrial complex, which is by some estimates even bigger than the, than the military industrial complex. This is the way things are going, friend. With the medical infrastructure being built, doctors being trained for various surgeries, clinics opening at warp speed, and the media celebrating it, transgenderism is poised for growth. Growth? How much more can it fucking grow? There's not going to be any babies left. The LGB, a once tiny group of people trying to love those of the same sex openly and be treated equally within society, has already been subsumed by capitalism and is now infiltrated by the medical industrial complex via transgenderism. This is a really good article, too. What the fuck? It's there. It's out there. People have these opinions. It's just buried in a wall of like, eh, you know, you have to just yes everyone to death and be a sycophant. What are we gonna and it say? almost makes me wonder if, if you posted some of these articles on Facebook, would you get the, uh, oh, fact check, medical misinformation, fact check, trigger warning, fact check, you know, doesn't community communist standards, whatever. Because, you know, these articles are out there, but well, or, or, or would the article just get taken down? Like, yeah. You know what I mean? like, yeah. Cause nobody's talking about it. And as soon as they start to, Oh, well, weird. That's it's, it's standard it's article like, got, got black hold. Weird. The keyboard warriors are like a swarm of piranha, you know, like the key is not to get mm -hmm. their attention. You know what I mean? Once you get their attention, they're like, ah, you know, they just, there's nothing left of you. Um, so, I mean, I could go on. Okay, you know, this is okay. This is this is really good. I honestly, I think if you'd be cool with it, I would want to get Allison McDowell on our podcast because she's like, oh, yeah, she she's I, you should check her out. She's as far as researchers go. Like the name's super familiar. I'm sure yeah, once I look in it, I'll be like, like oh, that's thing. where I heard she's about her. Kind of Allison a feud McDowell. with Derek Bros right now. I don't really want to get into it, but um, <laughs> God. Yeah, there's a lot oh, of like, talk about fucking slap fighting in the sandbox with oh oh we're we're arguing about bathroom usage with all these important issues. We got two people from the truth community in a spat. What else is I'm telling now? Telling you, I'm telling you, yeah, it's I did not realize that the truth community would be this dramatic. It's like the real world. It's yeah, I, okay. I, I don't know. I don't know what I expect. That's, okay. that's why. That's why a big part of me just kind of likes being on the fringe and like I'll contribute yeah. where I can. I'll put yeah. my stuff on the on the Great Work Network, and I don't mind being. Yeah, because I don't. That's all. I hate all that shit. We got yeah. so many more bigger problems than 
Well, that's whether Mark like. Passio is a flat earther, a round earther, right. whether yeah, James everything. Corbett's spinning logo is a subtle implication that he's tied to the whatever. Uh, yeah, every, everything is all about division. It's yeah. Everything. Um, okay, who works to institutionalize transgender ideology? Yeah, this is this is good shit. Much more important than funds going directly to the LGBT lobby and organizations, only a fraction of which trickles down to assist people who identify as transgender is the money invested by the men mentioned above, governments and technology and pharmaceutical corporations, to institutionalize and normalize transgenderism as a lifestyle choice. They are shaping the narrative about transgenderism and normalizing it within the culture using their funding methods. This can hardly be a coincidence when the very thing absolutely essential to those transitioning are pharmaceuticals and technology. This article will use the Pritzker family as a case study, both to reduce length and because they're emblematic of how this works. Those funding trans organizations. Yes. What were you going to say? Oh, just the the Pritzker was that uh, uh, John Goodman and drag looking person, right? (laughs) Yeah, that's him. I'm going to continue to be um, mean to him, her, as long as I can. Be, be, be just be, be your best narwhal self. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, live your bliss. Uh, let's see. All right. So the, those funding trans organizations and normalizing transgenderism are channeling funds in the same ways and invested in the same medical infrastructure. This can hardly be a coincidence when the very thing absolutely essential to those transitioning of pharmaceuticals and technology. It is also important to note that though the trans lobby has sown itself to the LGB umbrella, LGB people are as such are not lifelong medical patients. The Pritzkers are an American family of philanthropic billionaires worth approximately $29 billion. Holy fuck. Whose fortune was gestated by Hyatt hotels and nursing homes. So real, not, not a dark history there. <laughs> they now <laughs> They now have massive investments in the medical industrial complex. Examining just a few of the Pritzkers in this article will give you some indication of their reach and influence as a family, especially as regards the transgender project and their relationship to the medical industrial complex. As you read, remember, transitioning individuals are medical patients for life, and the Pritzker family are not an anomaly in their funding trajectory or investments in the medical industrial complex. Jennifer Pritzker. Once a family man and decorated member of the armed forces, CIA. Jennifer Pritzker now identifies as transgender. He has made transgenderism a high note in philanthropic funding through his Tawani Foundation. He is one of the largest contributors to transgender causes and, with his family, an enormous influence on the rapid institutionalization of transgenderism. Some of the organizations Jennifer Owns and funds are especially noteworthy to examining the rapid induction of transgender ideology into medical, legal, and educational institutions. Pritzker owns Squadron Capital, an acquisitions corporation with a focus on medical technology, medical devices, and orthopedic implants, and the Tawani Foundation, a philanthropic organization with a grants focus on gender and human sexuality. That's another difference between now and the ancient world is you didn't have fucking multinational billion dollar corporations like talking about this sexual identity sexuality identity thing that doesn't fucking exist you didn't it wasn't that wasn't a thing and again i think just to insert this really quickly once you create a name and an identity that's like the portal through which this shit is allowed to come through because as long as something doesn't have a name like uh i don't know like any random behavior that you that you do either maybe you only did it once in your life or you do it from time to time, or maybe you do do it every day, but there's no name for it. If there's no cultural identity that's labeled the label associated with it, then you cannot be categorized by that or for doing that. It's just a thing you do sometimes, but when everything is all out front and you go on Tinder and it's like, you know, I'm a green and purple striped Cheshire cat, you know, trans femme, non-binary, you know, top bottom dreidel. You know what I mean? Like then, then, then it's like, there's nothing, nothing is left to the imagination except that everything on that fucking list comes out of your imagination. Cause really it's like, what are you? You're just what you are. You're not a, you know? And so it, it does get very philosophical because it's like, ultimately we are not words. We're not labels. We're not descriptions and neither are our behaviors. They just are what they are in the moment. And then once the moment is gone, they're not anything, 
There's certainly not a cluster of words on a screen. Anyway, I digress. Let me continue. Pritzker sits on the leadership council of the Program of Human Sexuality at the University of Minnesota, to which he also committed $6.5 million over the past decade. Among many other organizations and institutions Pritzker funds are Lurie Children's Hospital, a medical center for gender nonconforming children serving 400 children in Chicago, the Pritzker School of Medicine at the University of Chicago, a chair of transgender studies at the University of Victoria, the first of its kind, and the Mark S. Bonham Center for Sexual Diversity Studies at the University of Toronto. The University of Toronto sounds like a fucking hellhole. I found another article. Yeah, it's, um, it's Canada's University of Chicago. It's yeah, it, it's it's anyway. He also funds the American Civil Liberties Union and his family funds Planned Parenthood. Huh. Two significant organizations for institutionalizing female erasing language and support for transgender causes. Planned Parenthood also recently decided to get into the transgender medical market. So what do all these things have in common? Chemicals, technology, drugs, and people having fewer babies and sterilizing people, whether it's through a hysterectomy or through chemical castration or through surgery or or the or the through, transplant of of dead w- wombs from dead people into right. former men so that they can right. hopefully maybe have babies. Well, the, so the so what you're saying is a woman apparently, but still. Oh, okay. But but, but ev- yeah. eventually it's going to that. But so Obviously. so what you're what I'm what I'm hearing is that maybe the whole epi eugenics idea was not too far off for all of this. Yeah, I mean we're there. Supporting we're, we're there. That, yeah. Um Okay. Uh, Jennifer Pritzker funds strategically, as does his family. I like that. Uh, by giving to universities that become beholden to his ideology, whose students go on to, this is exactly, this is classic uh, ideological subversion a la mm-hmm. Yuri Bezmenov. Giving to universities that become beholden to his ideology, whose students go on to spread gender ideology by writing pro trans articles and medical journals and elsewhere. Jennifer's uncle and aunt john and lisa pritzker gave 25 million dollars to the university of california at san francisco for a center of children's psychiatry jennifer likewise funds hospitals and medical schools where the alumni go on to create transgender specialties and lgbt medical centers even though lesbians gays and bisexuals don't need specialized medical services here are just several current activities of pritzker funded medical school alumni and recipients of pritzker money this is a long, long list. Yeah, I don't know if I'm read that whole list. You, we'll link up. We'll link this up so people can look at these if they want to. But I mean, yeah, let's just do a quick blah blah blah. Normalize transgender individuals in the military. Twenty five million to Norwich University in Vermont Military Academy. Um, not confined to the United States because yeah, I mean, what that bill we just gave like one hundred and twenty million to gender studies in Pakistan in this last bill. Are you looking at Obama? This girl the, from the family was the Secretary of Commerce. <sighs> people think that there's that that's just a coincidence. You think it's just a coincidence. All oh, these people are, you know, like it's an exceptional family that the that the dad's rich and the family's rich, and it's just it just so happens uh, that the yeah. daughter gets a high paying. You know, she's not working in the private sector. She's working for the public, although she's obviously deeply entrenched in the private sector. And you know what happens when there's a public, you know, and a private thing getting together and government and corporations are working together, right? That's what Mussolini called fascism, everybody. Dude, this is crazy. Cousin to Jennifer Pritzker. I'm definitely reading this part. I feel like Allison McDowell right now. Penny Pritzker, so cousin. Uh, served on President Obama's Council for Jobs and Competitiveness and Economic Recovery Advisory Board. She was National Co-Chair of Obama for America 2012 and National Finance Chair of Obama's 2008 presidential campaign. To say she was influential in getting President Obama elected would be an understatement. As Obama's Secretary of Commerce, Penny Pritzker helped create, get this, the National Institute for Innovation in Manufacturing Biopharmaceuticals by facilitating an award of $70 million from the U.S. Department of Congress, Commerce, the, the first funding of its kind. Obama made transgenderism a pet issue of his administration, holding a meeting at the White House, the first ever for transgenderism. And, and I hate to bring up another crazy conspiracy theory, but, you know, Michelle Obama. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's well known that Obama 
had male liaisons in college. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but then don't pretend to be a family man. <laughs> yeah, there was a guy, hands. There, there, was a guy, there was a guy that went on. Um, there, there was a guy that went on some some thing. Anyway, whatever. I'll t- I'll tell you that in private. That doesn't need to go in this okay. episode. It's a little a little much. Um, here we go. Okay. Um, The administration quietly applied the power of the executive branch to make it easier for transgender people to alter their passports, get cross-sex treatment at veterans administration facilities, and access public school restrooms and sports programs based on gender identity. That could not possibly lead to any issues. uh, These are just a few of the transgender-specific policy shifts of Obama's presidency. Soros and Gill are two other major transgender movement funders who generated millions of dollars to get Obama elected, and Stryker was one of the top five contributors to Obama's campaign. Under Obama and President George W. Bush, the federal government also funded the Tides Foundation $82.7 million, which in turn donated $47.2 million to LGBTQ issues over the past two decades. Penny has funded the Harvard School of Public Health and with her husband through their mutual foundation, the Pritzker Trubert Family Foundation, are funding early childhood initiatives as well as providing scholarships to Harvard University medical students. The Boston Children's Hospital Gender Management Services wing, fuck, physicians are all affiliated with Harvard Medical School. Penny Pritzker also sat on the board at Harvard where Student Life Office teaches students, many of whom go on to lead U.S. institutions, that there are more than two sexes. Prove it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um okay jb pritzker this is who um this is who what's her name alison mcdowell is always talking well about. and look at that look at that Dude, what that, is that, up with this article like look at how that is bold this? look at that bold quote there i don't know but we have to look at why this is framed as a civil rights issue when the main issues seem to be capital and social engineering in the standard they're saying that that's pretty I, i'm i'm telling you i'm impressed yeah you never know and this is why this is why for those of you out there who are certainly not not those listening but you certainly know people like this who will write off an entire outlet like the standard of the national review without reading because yes they are funded by whomever but every once in a while you keep your you keep your sources eclectic every once in a while you get surprised and 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 you get an article that talks about this, which is why it's not about it's about the information. It's about the information, and you can read an article without without it going in and infecting your brain. If you just go, okay, what is worth taking away from this? What you, is you, you, you know, know what's what? Not? At this point, I, I I mean, don't get me wrong. There's still a lot of censorship. There's a lot of policing. You know, there's a lot of of out of all of it there's a lot of shit getting deleted off the internet but there is a brazenness happening particularly with things like the medical literature like i um i i i i no, i won't say stumbled upon i well whatever i ended up reading some um pretty in-depth medical literature on i won't mention what it is but okay i'll tell you later um because I don't know, you know, how, how much leeway I have. It's an art podcast. I think we've pretty much flown the coop on that. But um, what do you call it? Um, and I was just blown away by you. It's literally free. Like, and anyone can go and read this shit. Like, it's all out in the open. The brazenness with which, and that's that's the the the, the dark, terrible, nightmarish, evil genius behind the internet is that if you just put out enough shit, you can bury the truth just through sheer volume and just damn near guarantee that people will never read, you know, the truth because they're too busy reading other shit because there's so much shit to read. Yeah, it's the drinking out of the drinking out of the fire hose analogy. So uh, it just goes on and on. Yeah, I can't. Oh, look. Wow. Would you look at that? 
along with support by pharmaceutical giants such as Janssen Therapeutics, the health foundation of a Johnson & Johnson brother, Vive, Pfizer, Abbott Laboratories, Bristol Myers Squibb Company, and Boehringer Ingelheim Pharmaceuticals, uh, major technology <laughs> corporations including Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Intel, Dell, and IBM, oh my God, it's like a who's who of, of COVID and all this shit, are also funding the Transgender Project. In February 2017, Apple, Microsoft, Google, IBM, Yelp, PayPal, and 53 other mostly tech corporations signed into an am onto an amicus brief pushing the U.S. Supreme Court to prohibit schools from keeping private facilities for students designated according to sex. Whoa. As these corporations were pushing for transgender bathrooms, they were fighting President Trump's travel ban and immigration policies. In reporting the incidents simultaneously, CNN News made the obvious connection between the corporation's interest in the immigration ban and commerce, quoting a legal brief signed by the companies that said, it is inflicting significant harm on American business, innovation, and growth. It made no such equivalent connection for the corporation's interest in transgender rights. The obvious question would be, why do they care? The obvious answer is money. It behooves us all to look at what the real investment is in prioritizing a lifetime of antibody, anti-body medical treatments for a minuscule part of the population. Wow. I, I, think, I think that's a good place to stop. I, I, um, I can't see the light anymore. We've reached the bottom of the rabbit hole. There's too many dead rabbits. We've got about we've got about six podcasts here. Yeah, this is this is gonna have to be like a parts one, two, and three, like you know, just we're not gonna be at a loss for, for you know, it'd be double posting for a couple yeah, weeks. Yeah, there's gonna need to be like a uh I don't even know, not even a trigger warning, just like a <laughs> you know, like get some beard oil because you're gonna have one by the time you finish <sighs> watching this. Um, anyway, I mean, about art, you know, <laughs> well, everybody, I'll link, I'll link, uh, uh, something you can look at, I don't know, the sculpture setter and hermaphrodite that'll turn it into, uh, that'll bring it all together in that's art. That's how we, that's how we fly under the radar. Yeah. Cause hello and welcome to another episode of make art, not friends. They're trying to exterminate and sterilize the human race through pharmaceuticals into transgender movement. But there's a sculpture. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Moving on, Michelangelo's David serves as a prime <laughs> example of the height of Renaissance. Um, yeah, I mean, it's... Yeah, it's funny when I tell people this is an art podcast. <laughs> I mean, the first few, the first few, you know, were. I think it's really great. It's, like, very tongue-in-cheek. Well, and, we, you know, we talked about... We talked about mythology, which has a lot of, you know, roots, symbolism and all of the, you know, that's what it all ultimately comes down to. It does. It does. Is, is, because, is art yeah. is one of the symbol languages, one of the, the, the languages of communication. And, and we can see that symbol and I'll go back to this again. We can see that symbol of what's supposed to be the divine union in the individual consciousness of the masculine and the feminine, which has been depicted as the hermaphrodite and glorified in different myth mystic traditions from Egypt to pre-Columbian Mexico to Australia, far and wide. And now right. that whole concept is going to be taken from us, perverted exactly. and sold back to us at a price by the pharmaceutical companies, by the tech giants, by, by the government industrial complex, by, you know, this big cartel system and, and that's all they can do is just take nature and just chop it up, fill it with chemicals, put it in a blender, add some fucking cultured immortal fetal cells that probably have cancer and then sell it back to us in a vegan gluten-free fucking milkshake. That's yeah. the world we live in. What I briefly wanted to say, and I, I don't mean to cut you off, is that ultimately it does all come back to symbolism and to art because, and if you think about like, you know, the Bible as an astro theological myth and stuff, the same thing that has led to this white bread Christianity where it's like, yes, it's literally this, it's literally this. Never mind the fact that Bethlehem literally means the house of bread and corresponds to Virgo 
and it all has to do with raising the oil and the, the oil has to it's Santos Bonacci. You can maybe link some of his stuff. He explains all of this, but that's why I'm studying Hebrew is because English is actually very similar to Hebrew. But anyway, all of this stuff, it springs from not understanding symbolism, because if you do understand symbolism, then when someone presents you with the literalized version of, Oh, you literally can be anything you want. You can literally have, you know, this and this and that, and you should, and you should be this androgyne. If you know symbolism, if you know mythology, you can say, oh, no, thank you. I've read that story. It was a great story, and I think I know what it's trying to, to get across, but you don't have to sew uh, the, uh, the other genitalia on me that I don't have. I don't want that. I don't need that, and I don't think that's going to accomplish anything, and I think that's at the heart of so much of this is this it's like the cargo cult of spirituality. You're familiar with that concept, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's Christianity or whatever, it's like, well, if I just nail myself to a claw across, it's like, no, that doesn't, that doesn't do anything that you'll just bleed a lot. You know what I mean? It's like, if I just like, sew a penis onto myself, it's like same, same concept. You'll just bleed a lot. That doesn't, it, it, you're not in the the subconscious realm of archetypes. You're in the real world, and like different things are bring about accomplishments in the real world than in the symbolic world. And so there's been a short circuiting of that for people. And I do think that you know lack of knowledge, and I'm sure Mark Passio would agree, is the primary reason that it's it's so easy to pull the wool over people's eyes and you know they're just like it's progressive and yeah this is progress and it's like no it's not it's crazy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but yeah um and you know, with that course. i'm going to yeah. say thank you for joining us on another extended episode of make art not friends we'll see you next time <laughs>